Code First is the newest way to use the Entity Framework to query a database or perform different types of CRUD operations, create, read, update, and delete. So what Code First allows us to do is interact through the Entity Framework with a database and automatically select result sets and fill our target objects, our classes that we write, or even push our classes back to the database for processing as far as the data anyway in the classes for insert, update, and delete scenarios. So Code First itself relies on something called a DB context. And the way it works is you'll create a class, such as an employee class. And you'll add in the different properties that you'd want for that class, first name, last name, those types of things. And for this example, let's say that employees can have one or more time cards associated with them based on date. Well, these classes are just normal, plain old CLR or POCO classes. They're just normal classes with properties, nothing fancy, no custom attributes, no custom uh, inheritance going on or interfaces or anything like that. They're just very standard .NET classes, which makes it nice. Well, these classes can interact with a DB context class that we'll write in the upcoming demonstration. And ultimately, as they interact with this class, we can create a database based upon the employee class and the time card class and have something like an employees table and a time cards table automatically generated in this database. So with the code first approach, you write the classes based upon what your application needs, which makes sense. Then you'll let this DB context class and the entity framework that's supporting behind it automatically generate the database tables and then from there on it just works. It's very simple and it's very clean once you understand the fundamentals of it. So let me show you a demonstration of how we can get started installing code first with Entity Framework 4.1 and how we can start writing our classes and our DB context. The easiest way to get started with Entity Framework and Code First is to get NuGet installed. Now NuGet is a package manager. It's a way to get modules, including different types of files, DLLs, configuration, all that stuff into your project. So you can either go to NuGet.org, you can download it from here, or the easiest way to do this is simply go up to Tools, Extension Manager, and go to the online gallery and search for NuGet, N-U-G-E-T. So you'll see I already have it installed. Came with the version I have of Visual Web Developer Express. But I can go out to type NuGet in the search, go there, and then there would be a little install here. Now, once you've done that, there's a couple ways to run something called a package manager using NuGet to get in this Entity Framework Code First feature. Okay, One way is I can right-click on References and say Add Library Package Reference. I can go online. This will go search NuGet where these packages are available and then type Entity Framework. Alright, there it is. If I hit install here though, you see I get this message. It says operation failed, the package contains some PowerShell scripts and I have to use the package manager console. Okay, so no big deal. What we'll do is we'll go to tools, library package manager and we'll go to package manager console. Now this uses PowerShell and you can see I've already typed in the commandlet for PowerShell, install packages that called a commandlet that we can actually run to install Entity Framework. So we simply install a package called Entity Framework and hit enter. Now what this will do is automatically download all the stuff we need, it's already done it, to get Entity Framework 4.1 going and it actually puts reference, references into our project. There's Entity Framework right there so that we can now work with this code first technology. Very, very nice and easy to work with. So let me show you what we can do with code first. Now that I have Entity Framework code first available in the project, I can start to write some code and you're going to see I can generate a database from the different classes that I write and ultimately my classes will match up with tables in the database. So I've already created two classes. I have one called employee. You'll notice it has an ID has first name, last name, department, and then a collection of time cards. I also have a time card class. It also has an ID, submission date, and then the different hours for each day of the week. So what we can do now is we can provide a way using code first to be able to query against a database, but the problem is we don't have a database at this point. Well with code first, you'll do what it says. You'll write your classes first 
and then you use those classes in something called a DB context to ultimately generate the database and the associated tables that map to those classes. Now we're going to cover the fundamentals here. You can actually do some pretty cool stuff with table mappings in NAD Framework Code first. But to get started, what I need is something called a DB context class. So because my project is called Time Tracker, I'm just going to go ahead and add in a new class. And I'm going to call this Time Tracker Context. Or let's just do DB context so we actually know for sure. We'll call it DB context. And we'll add that. Now, I'm going to derive this class from another class that's part of NED Framework called DB Context. So let me resolve that. And because we already had the reference added by the NuGet package to NED Framework, we can simply resolve System Data Entity as the namespace and we're ready to go. So what I want to do is say DB Set. And I want to make a property of DB Set of Employee or DB Set of Time Card. And the way we do that is we can do our properties, do db set of employee, and we'll call this employees. And then we'll do the same thing for time cards. And we are done with a very simple db context class. Now, the way this works is you need a connection string, though, for a database, of course. And we don't have a database yet. Well, what will happen is when you run the DB context and query against it, which I'll do in a moment, it'll actually use a web config connection string that you define and then go out and make the database based upon your code first classes. So what we need to do is go into web.config and add in our connection string. So let me open up web.config and we'll come in and simply add a connection string section. And then we'll follow the standard ASP.NET way of adding connection strings, which is to do add. We're going to do name equals. And the name is going to equal our DB context class. Now, that is something you can change and modify, but that's what it does by default. We need a connection string. And for the connection string, I'm going to use SQL Express. So I'm going to use my SQL Express instance. And we're going to say server equals. We want to use my credentials to log in. So we'll say integrated security equals SSPI, or you could do true in this case. And we'll say database is, we'll just call it time tracker. And we'll go ahead and save that. Now, the other thing that we need to add is the type of provider, because Entity Framework is capable of working with more than just SQL Server. Uh, so we can come in and do our provider name. And this is just the namespace of SQL Server. So system.data.sql client is what we can put there. OK, so now we have our connection string, we have our DB context, and then we have our two classes that ultimately we'd like to create tables for those. But what I'm doing here, and what's nice about code first, is I'm writing the classes that my application actually needs. I'm not basing it on what somebody else thought I might need from a relational database standpoint. And in certain situations, this works very, very well. So now to use this guy, I need to be able to come in and hook up a page and run it to this DB context. Now, what I'm going to do, though, is instead of putting any query methods in the DB context, I'm going to create a class I like to call a repository. And we're just going to call this time tracker repository. And in this class, I'm going to add a public method that returns a list of employee. We'll call it get employees. All right, now from here, we can go in and do a very simple query to actually get the employees, return those back, and then I'll bind that with an object data source, which I already have that code ready to go. And so we'll come in and say return, and we want to say for each employee, from employee in. Uh, and we need a time tracker class. Well, we have one, but I need a new instance of it. So right above here, in case we have other methods, I'm going to create a context variable just like that. And now we can do from each employee in our context employees. Notice that's reading the DB set I just added. 
then let's go ahead and return that as a list. We're going to wrap this and we're going to come and say select each employee. So a very simple link query here to list. And there we go. So we had now have a way to query against our DB context and get the employees and return those out. So let me go ahead and do a quick build, make sure I don't have any typos, looks good. And then what I've already done is I've already hooked up a grid and the grid has an object data source. Let me show you the configuration for that. That simply calls into a, a repository, which we don't have that one, but we do have a time tracker repository. And there's my get employees. And then we'll hit finish and we're ready to go. Now I'm going to run this you're not going to see anything because not only do we not have a database, but we also have no employees in the database. But you'll see I don't get an error or anything. All right, well, let's see what happened here. I'm going to go to the Data Connections tab, and we're going to add a connection. I'll change this to go to SQL Server. And I'm going to do dot slash SQL Express. I'm now going to come down and notice I now have a time tracker database. So let's test that. Looks like it works. Hit OK and drill down. So here is what it added. It automatically added an employees table for us based upon our different uh, properties that we wanted and then it added a you can see time cards and it even has an employee ID for the primary foreign key relationship uh, between employees and time cards and it did that because I had that list of employees in the time card class. Now it also does a little bit of tracking uh, in this EDM metadata. So each object gets a hash and this is how it knows if things have changed. And so if we do show table data here, you'll see that it generated for what I have currently this hash. And if things change, it knows that uh, we need to either throw an exception or deal with creating a new database. Now there's ways around that, but that's what it does by default. It's kind of what it, how it detects changes in your objects. So now what we can do is we can go in and add employees into our uh, table. So let's just do an employee or two real quick. So we'll say uh, first name and, and let me show you also that when we go into uh, properties here that we have uh, a is identity, there it is, is true. And so this is an identity or a, a key. I automatically took care of that for us, pretty nice. So we'll go ahead and just do some names here. And for department, we'll say finance. We'll do Jane Doe is in um, HR. And we could add as many as we'd like, but we'll go with that. Now let's rerun it in the browser, and you'll notice I instantly get records back. Very cool. The reason I like this is because with Code First, I'm now able to actually take a code centric approach, design the actual model classes, what I like to call them, with the properties, then hook up my DB context, and then we can simply write queries against this DB context, which we did with our repository. We wrote a really simple one here, but we could do filtering and all that good stuff by simply querying the DB context. It makes it very, very easy to work with. So that's an example of how you get started with Code First.